So uh, our next speaker, uh, last speaker of this afternoon is uh, Professor uh, Michael Cates from Cambridge University. Uh, his work uh, focuses on the theory of soft matter, such as polymers, colloids, gels, liquid crystals, and granular materials. Um, a recurring goal of his research is to predict uh, constitutive equations uh, relating the stress in a flowing material with its flow history. He has also worked on theories of active matter, particularly dense suspensions of cell-propelled particles, uh, which, can include, which can include, sorry, uh, motile bacteria. Uh, his interests are, are also include uh, fundamental field theories of active systems in which uh, time reversal symmetry is absent. Uh, such theories uh, are characterized by non-zero steady state entropy production. Uh, indeed, uh, today he will talk about a related topic, informatic versus thermodynamic entropy production in active systems. So thank you very much for your attention and please, uh, Professor Kale, Kate, uh, go on. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Pablo, for the introduction and uh, thanks to all the organizers for inviting me to this excellent uh, meeting. Okay, so I'm going to talk today a bit about two different uh, or conceptually distinct views of entropy production in active systems, by which I mean systems in which particles have some uh, inherent local dissipation, uh, which are being forced through some kind of self-propulsion. Um, I just want to acknowledge my collaborators here on this slide, uh, Tomo Markovic, Etienne Fodor, Elson Chung, who are all uh, previous group members in Cambridge, and Oyfint Bothne, who is still a group member. So I need to put this here. Okay, so um, I'll introduce the topic by um, uh, talking briefly about stochastic thermodynamics, first for particles and then for fields. Stochastic thermodynamics being uh, the set of uh, recent or relatively recent discoveries to do with um, entropy production and uh, fluctuation theorems. Uh, allowing you to talk about, in thermodynamic terms, about individual trajectories or very small systems. And um, the main focus, though, is going to be on systems where uh, the, the dynamics is very far from equilibrium, so that there's no real sense in talking about a free energy in the sense of E minus TS, the usual thermodynamic description. So that applies in coarse-grained active matter, where we're looking for theories which describe assemblies of large numbers of particles, but where the individual particles are doing, some, doing something very far from uh, uh, near equilibrium behavior. But even in that limit, we can define something which is mathematically and structurally equivalent to an entropy production rate. We call that the informatic entropy production rate, EPR. And I'll say a bit about how it differs from the thermodynamic one. However, <clears throat> there are many other active systems, for instance, uh, uh, molecular motors inside a cell, where the microscopic dynamics, although it's driven out of equilibrium, is near enough to equilibrium to at least talk meaningfully about a free energy structure lying behind. So it should be possible in these uh, active systems to restore thermodynamics, at least in some appropriate cases. Uh, and I will talk about that. And there are a few surprises there as to what happens to the entropy production when we put back uh, uh, a thermodynamic interpretation within the active context. And then in the last part of the talk, I want to talk about, uh, the, as we'll see, uh, and upcoming slides, the, the stochastic thermodynamics is, deeply connects entropy production with the relative probabilities of forwards and backwards trajectories under time evolution. Uh, and to make sense of that, we need to say what a backward trajectory exactly means. And we'll see also that for far from equilibrium systems, that, that is ambiguous. And uh, I will discuss the different varieties of informatic entropy production that eventually emerge under different choices uh, for how we define backward paths. And then I'll conclude. So I want to start then with the dynamics of a particle. So consider an overdamped particle, so no inertia. So at the top of this slide is the Langevin equation for such a, such a particle in a potential V in one dimension. M is a mobility. Uh, D, which is M times KT, is a diffusion constant. And lambda in that top equation is white noise, zero mean unit variance, for which the probability distribution of lambda is in the second equation here, this one. So we know that lambda is some Gaussian process. And just by uh, saying that x dot plus m dv dx is equal to square root 2d lambda, 
we can calculate the probability for a forward path trajectory, which is the top line of the next ratio here. But I can also consider the reversed path in which I reverse the velocity, but keep the potential the same. And that gives me a probability for the reversed trajectory, which is the denominator in the uh, ratio there. So that's PF over PB, F for forward, B for backward. And a key result from stochastic thermodynamics is that this ratio is the exponential up to factor of KB of the entropy change of the system plus the bath uh, between the initial and the final state. And so uh, if you think of that in terms of the second law, and this connects of course with what Dan was discussing earlier, uh, T times this entropy reduction delta S, I can then write uh, as this integral here. Now I get this from the, this ratio by noticing that the squared terms cancel top and bottom. So it's only the cross terms that contribute and they contribute uh, with a two X dot MV prime in the top line and a minus two same thing in the bottom line, which is why I get this factor four. And so when the dust settles on that, T delta S, the uh, heat, if you like, is the difference in the potential energy of the particle uh, between the initial and the final state. So that's, you can think of that as second law, it's also in, encodes the first law, conservation of energy. If I now think of a similar particle, but in the, ex, uh, the presence of some non-conservative force, so let's uh, write that as F, so I have a conservative part and a non-conservative force F, then now uh, I can get a non-zero steady state entropy production. In particular, if I do exactly the same calculation, I calculate the uh, logarithmic ratio of forward and backward path probabilities, um, and I divide by the time interval and then take that interval to be very long, so T2 minus T1 tends to infinity, I get two contributions to the entropy production, one of which is the uh, change in potential between the initial final state, but that is extinguished by the fact that I'm dividing it now by a long time interval. So I'm looking for the rate of entropy production over this uh, arbitrary long period. And then the remaining term is the time average of the work done by the non-conservative force. So the rate of work by F sets the rate of entropy production in the steady state for this particle. Uh, this is a proper thermodynamic entropy production in the sense that it doesn't only measure in a quantitative way the extent to which the particle is uh, non-conservative, which it clearly does measure through this uh, uh, rate of working by the non-conservative force, but it also tells me about the uh, heat flow, the rate of heat flow into the reservoir. Okay, uh, so that all fits together. What I want to do next is give you the same results effectively, but in terms of systems which are described by fields. So let's uh, stick to the simplest case, which is a scalar field. And let's imagine that the scalar field describes a, a mixture of two types of molecule, A and B. So phi, which is now a function of space and time, is uh, as shown in the top line here, I can construct it as the difference in densities the number densities of the two types of particle divided by their sum. So that's just a, a conventional way of doing it and it ranges between minus one and plus one. And a typical structure uh, analogous to the Langevin equation for a particle for uh, the dynamics of such a field, which is a conserved field. So because that's a conserved field, its rate of change is the divergence of a current. The current typically involves a mobility M times the gradient of a chemical potential, which is a, a, a free energy functional uh, differentiate with respect to phi. And again, there's a noise which comes from thermal noise with a, 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 a diffusivity or a, a noise amplitude in front of uh, now spatiotemporal unit white noise that is also related directly to the mobility through the fluctuation dissipation relation. So from this, you can calculate the forward and backward path weights for a, a fluctuating space time trajectory and it's given, the, those two probabilities are given by the two exponentials written here with a plus or minus in front of the J. And that's because the current uh, reverses sign on time reversal, whereas the uh, con conservative force representing the, by, by the free energy derivative here uh, does not. And so again, uh, for a, an equilibrium system or a system which is, is governed by a free energy in this Langevin equation, I can calculate the uh, entropy uh, production T delta S in some uh, between some initial and final state. 
Uh, and by the time I've noticed again that the cross terms, the, the square terms cancel or are the same for PF and PB and I only get the cross terms, I end up with an integral which is J dot grad mu, mu being the chemical potential or DF by D phi. So again, the uh, heat flow into the bath is given by the difference in, of the free energy functional evaluated between the final and the initial states. So uh, that again is all kind of uh, uh, consistent with traditional thermodynamics. And what I want to do now is consider the precisely analogous thing of adding a non-conservative force to the particle, which is add to the equation for the current a piece y, which is a forcing term of some kind. So the point about this forcing term is that it cannot be written in general as something involving the gradient of chemical potential. Its form is arbitrary for the moment, but uh, we'll make some choices based on kind of general ideas of uh, smoothness and Taylor expansions and landau ginzburg theory later on. So then again, I can uh, essentially what I do, just as, as I was saying before, is I make y, the, uh, I make lambda rather the subject of that equation. I know the probability density for lambda because that's unit white noise. And I get uh, the two path integrals, uh, oops, excuse me, go back, uh, in the middle of this slide for the forward and backward uh, probability density for a, a space-time trajectory phi of r and t uh, in terms of the current that is needed to, to build it. So again, I can calculate a steady state entropy production rate. And again, I get a piece, and it's, it's done in exactly the same way. Again, I get a, a piece which uh, involves the difference in the free energy of the initial and final state as I calculated on the previous slide. But by the time I take the steady state limit and look at for a, a rate of entry production, this has to vanish because the time interval is going to infinity. And I'm left with a piece which is the analog of the XF term for a particle, which is the integral over space of uh, the time average uh, of j dot y. So I get the actual current, take the dot product with the forcing term, divide it by the mobility in the j equation and integrate that over all space. And the spatial integral is important because in a system uh, that has any kind of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, such as a system uh, undergoing phase separation, then uh, even though I take an infinite long time limit, uh, the, this, this time average of j dot y could be different in different regions of space because I might have coexistence, for instance, between a dense phase and a less dense phase, in which case I'll get different values for the integrand in this steady state entropy production. So in writing that down, again, I've assumed that the system has got a proper free energy and that y is some kind of force. So let's clarify the assumptions behind this uh, in a minute, but first give you an example. Um, and that is to talk about a minimal model of active phase separation. So phase separation in a system where particles don't, where the dynamics doesn't have detailed balance, but I want to describe that with a, a scalar phi four field theory of the same general type as is used for systems in or close to thermal equilibrium, uh, where this is the model I've described without the Y term is called model B. So if I choose that free energy structure there shown with the uh, a quartic polynomial and square gradient piece and choose a negative uh, quadratic coefficient, this will give me phase separation. So that's what model B is all about. And uh, I can explore the dynamics of such phase separation with the Langevin equation I was uh, writing down just now. So that's a very well studied subject for at least uh, three or four decades. Um, but what I'm going to say in, in, in this context is that the Y term, which is this, a term which is not of the form of the derivative of a free energy. If you look at what that should be to lowest order in the gradient expansion, consistent with the idea of doing landau ginzburg theory in model B, uh, there's two pieces to Y. Uh, the first one with the coefficient lambda grad, grad phi squared defines something called active model B, uh, which we started looking at a number of years ago now. And then soon after it, we realized there's actually a second term at the same order, uh, which is slightly different and uh, uh, it looks like this B plus piece here. So uh, the, the, to include both terms is, is 
defines a model we call active model B plus. And it's a, a, not important for this talk, but the, the, the interesting observation of the second term is it isn't the gradient of, the, it's a current, which is not the gradient of anything. So that current can have a curl, which is not true of this uh, first term in lambda here. But the first term in lambda, because it's the gradient of grad phi squared, isn't the gradient of any df by d phi. There is no f for which that is a functional derivative. So according to the equation on the previous slide, I can calculate the entry production and it's this integral of j dot y time averaged over space, again divided by m. So um, there's a problem with this, and that is that this model for active phase separation um, could describe molecules with some uh, microscopic drive that I can think of as being very close to equilibrium, in which case to think of Y as a force of some kind on the particles makes perfect sense on the A and B molecules. But the molecule, the, the model, active model B plus was actually derived on completely general grounds and could equally well describe a situation like this. So for instance, I can have uh, an order parameter phi, which is telling me about the local density of some sheep and some goats. Um, and it's still true that phi, if uh, uh, I have a conserved number of sheep and goats, so it's still, its time derivative must be the gradient of the current. And I can still construct a current in some kind of Landau-Ginzburg expansion as a, as a gradient expansion in powers of phi. Um, I can still write the current as some integrable bit uh, which I can call gradient of df by d phi. I can find, a, a, gather the pieces such as the pure polynomial pieces in, uh, so grad phi, for instance, is the gradient of df by d phi where f is phi squared. So there will be pieces that are integrable, but there will also be pieces like the y terms that I've described, and those are the lowest order terms that are not, and there will be some noise. Now, I can still compute the thing that I called the entropy production on the previous slide. Uh, and there it is, integral of j dot y time average now over d, just taking factor of k, kb out. Uh, and um, in what follows, I'll be referring to this, this integrand here as sigma. So that's something that's as, as a local density of this entropy production like quantity. But it's clear that if I'm actually thinking about a system of sheep and goats, or indeed anything bigger than much bigger than molecules, then this has very little to do with the actual flow of heat in the system. So what I'm saying is that I can define this informatic quantity, uh, which is quantifying in an unambiguous way, the irreversibility of the system in the sense of the relative probability of seeing a forward time evolution and the same sequence uh, run backwards. But this is only connected directly to heat flow if that function f or the functional f that lives inside the current j is some sort of free energy. It does have the form an energy minus t times an entropy of the system and d is something related to a mobility. And in particular, the driving force y has to be a proper force. Whereas in the case of sheep and goats, the fact that a sheep might avoid a goat is nothing to do with a force between a sheep and a goat. It's actually to do with animal psychology that they want to be with their own kind or whatever. And so it's clear that there's this kind of in-between level where the coarse grain description is not aware of whether it has or has not a connection with heat flow. But the mathematical object that would determine the heat flow if it did, which we're calling the informatic entropy production rate, is something that is still uh, saying interesting things about the dynamics of the system. So um, if we just take the simplest case, so active model B, <coughs> which is the version with the lambda term without the zeta term, so just the, 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 the simplest of the two pieces there, it's quite easy to calculate the integrand uh, here, or an integrand which differs from that only by integration by parts, sigma of R. So thinking of that as a local ent informatic entropy production. What we find is in a situation like the one shown here, which is a phase separation between positive and negative phi, so it could be sheep and goats, or it could be two types of molecule. Um, so there's an interface, which is uh, shown in black in the panel on the right, and the entropy production density, so sigma, uh, has a big peak at the interface. And indeed, 
it's, it's interesting to look at it scaling with the noise. It scales like uh, the noise variance, so D, to the first power in bulk phases and D to the zero at the interface. So uh, this is showing us uh, interesting structure as to where the irreversible stuff is happening in active model B uh, in its state of phase separation. And it's possible to speak more generically about this. Uh, if we have some coarse grain fields, generically speaking, the, this um, uh, IEPR density, so the, the local rate of informatic entropy production uh, for, of the coarse grain field will scale like D to the minus one. So it will actually blow up if the dynamics that I have breaks time reversal symmetry or detailed balance at a deterministic level. Um, in this situation here of Axe Model B, it doesn't because the deterministic evolution lands at a static profile phi of x. And so that static profile, if I run the movie backwards, it's clearly the same. I have to have fluctuations to see any dynamics at all, which is why in this case, um, I get d to the zero. So then uh, d to the zero at the interface, uh, which means it's that uh, time reversal symmetry is broken at leading order by the fluctuations. And if I get a higher power of d, d as I have in the bulk here, then there's, that's only broken at higher, higher order in fluctuation. So I need to look at a correlation of pairs of fluctuations, for instance, to see uh, the fact that the dynamics was not reversible. Okay, so let's compare and contrast uh, thermodynamic versus informatic entropy production rate. Well, it's clear that if I take this sheep goat system, the actual thermal entropy production rate exceeds the informatic one by a factor that is so vast that I might as well think of it as infinite. In particular, the full entropy production rate, which is dominated by microphysics, firstly gives no insight into whether uh, sheep and goat might face separation. But the point is that the, the backward path has to reverse everything, including the internal, internal metabolism of a sheep or a goat, as well as emotion. So a static sheep, which has, is, it may look completely reversible as far as its dynamics is concerned, its velocity is zero, is of course just turning food into heat at some enormous rate. <clears throat> Where, so uh, whereas the, the informatic EPR is a self-contained probe of the macroscopic dynamics, it only looks at what I can see at the level of my coarse grain fields. And for that reason also, it will depend on our definition of backward path, which I'll come to at the end. So uh, then there are these two very different views, and I'm uh, grateful really to Christian Mays for insisting that we distinguish them because I think it's a very fruitful thing to do rather than just say, oh, here's a field, here's its entry production. Um, but then it should be possible to do some kind of joining up exercise in the case where, for instance, I have an active system which might be molecular motors or, or some kind of uh, subcellular system, for instance, where I'm close enough to equilibrium to talk about a proper free energy um, then it's clear that the, the, the full, if I, if, if I have some coarse grain description of it, the full heat production has to be bigger than the informatic part. We'll have explicit examples of that later on. But it could be uh, close enough that they, the, the, the two things are interesting to actually compare rather than just say, well, this is, you know, infinitely different. So the inf if I take such a thing, a, a say active phase separation of uh, close to equilibrium subcellular, for example, the informatic entropy production rate just tells me about the coarse grain dynamics with my active terms y, which live in the coarse grain equation for the current. Um, but even at a minimal level, to uh, find anything like a, a, a heat flow, I need to also include the chemical processes which give rise to that dynamics. So in such a situation, you expect the uh, IEPR and the, and the, the full EPR involved, uh, as the, the, the heat flux to be distinct but relatable concepts in principle. So what I want to do in this middle part of the talk is say how. So thermal active matter uh, is what I mean by this, near equilibrium, well-defined temperature, well-defined free energy, well-defined uh, diffusion constant. So the kind of system we're thinking about here, something I might have a reservoir of fuel, reservoir products and a slab of the active system. So I can think of uh, this system as being driven by a delta mu, which is a proper chemical potential difference for fuel and products. And these could be, of course, the ATP, uh, ADP rather than hydrogen peroxide and, and water. 
So I can talk about this as a thermodynamic system. And I'm assuming it's near equilibrium. So I have a well-defined temperature, free energy mobility. There's a chemical drive, which is delta mu, uh, which is uh, the difference in chemical potential, say, between ADP and ADP in some subset of the system that happens to phase separate. So as a simple illustration of this, and there are more illustrations in this uh, Markovich et al paper, let's take a system which has a scalar composition variable. So it does a, a phase separation. But this phase separation is being driven by some chemistry, uh, which is dependent on an, a drive, which is delta mu. And I need a reaction coordinate. It turns out the convenient thing is something like a local density of ATP minus ADP, divided by two for trivial reasons. So the idea then is this whole system described in this box here can be uh, framed as a system uh, close to equilibrium and therefore described by linear irreversible thermodynamics in which the current and the rate of change of the reaction coordinate are related linearly by an on-saga matrix to the driving terms and these driving terms are both equilibrium like one is the gradient of chemical potential in the sense of the fields, ground df d phi. The other is the delta mu I just introduced for the chemi chemistry. And there are also noise terms, which I'll mention again in a minute. So I have an on saga matrix. And what that means is I can deduce something from on the on saga theorem or reciprocity. Specifically, I've written down again at the top here, the, the equation, equation for the current, which has my y terms in it which are things like lambda grad grad phi squared. And the point is that that active current has to be driven by delta mu. And I'm close to equilibrium, so it has to be linear in delta mu. So that y is delta mu times g, where g here is an off-diagonal on saga coupling. And it's vectorial because the j is a, is a vectorial thing. So off-diagonal in the sense of coupling between the chemistry, delta mu and n, and the field variables phi and their current j. But if I know that, I know that the off-diagonal on saga element, and I know the on saga matrix is symmetric, and therefore I have got the equation for the reaction coordinate. So the first term here, gamma delta mu, just says the chemistry happens in proportion to delta mu. But now I have an off-diagonal coupling, which says it also cares about what's happening to the fields. And then I have a noise term as well. Okay. So uh, importantly, because this uh, on saga coupling, coupling off diagonal is not zero, the noise terms in these two equations are correlated. And because uh, of that, uh, and because of the form of y, um, the off diagonal noise is actually multiplicative. So for uh, experts and to do with Langevin equations, this uh, multiplicative noise is a bit of a headache but uh, we do know roughly what to do with it. And there are more, many more details in this Markovich et al paper. So things are not quite as they seem in terms of the noise, but in terms of the uh, on saga deterministic part, it's quite simple. So if I look at the, what I'm not gonna call the full entropy production rate, um, in other words, I calculate for the joint system of uh, coarse grained uh, phi field and reaction coordinates, um, the uh, ratio of the logarithm, uh, the logarithmic ratio, uh, ratio of the forward and path, backward path probabilities, take the limit in the usual way. That should give me the, the proper heat production in this system close to equilibrium. And it does, and its form is sort of trivial. Namely, it's uh, integral over space n dot delta mu. And that is the rate of chemical work. So it's not surprising to get this result because the only uh, energy coming into the system is through the uh, fact that I'm holding the, the chemical potential away from equilibrium. So the rate of chemical work has to all come out as heat. It's just like x dot f for a single particle. However, this equation is more interesting than it looks because I can write down from the n equation, just multiply the n dot equation with its off diagonal term, multiply that by delta mu. I have in it from the off diagonal on saga coupling y dot gradient of df phi substitute in what that is from the J equation. And I find that this same expression here has interesting spatial structure, which is down at the bottom. So the actual heat production in this near equilibrium system 
can be written as the sum of what we called the informatic entropy production uh, for just the phi field. So that's what I would get if I just look at phi dynamics and say, how reversible is this dynamics without caring at all about what the chemistry is actually doing. There's also a large constant here, gamma delta mu squared over T, which has no spatial structure, completely boring. And however, combined uh, with that uh, is this piece. So the chemical part, which is the second two pieces here, is non-trivial, has a non-trivial spatial structure. And uh, it is also positive, uh, so long as the on saga matrix remains positive as it must do for stability. So I have an informatic contribution and a chemical contribution, but they have separate and differently interesting spatial variation. So if we just see what happens there, so if we take again active model B, the simplest case we know how to deal with, there again is the form of Y. I said before that the local informatic entropy production density just from the phi field goes like D to the zero and one in the interface in the bulk. Uh, if I look at the chemical contribution, uh, this goes like D to the minus one everywhere. And that just corresponds to the fact that I said before, uh, if the dynamics uh, breaks detailed balance at deterministic level, with this, which this chemistry dynamics certainly does, there's a constant chemistry, chemical flux going on here. I get D to the minus one everywhere, but it still depends on phi because the off diagonal on saga coupling has got phi in it. And so what I actually get when the dust settles is this blue curve here, an enormous contribution, but one which actually has these strong structure of uh, dips close to the, uh, the interface. And then separately, at a, a, a lower order in noise, uh, or a higher order in noise, so a smaller contribution at low noise, is the informatic piece. So we see that the chemical contribution is reduced at, uh, where the gradient, or the, the curvature is phi is biggest. If you look at the form of Y, you can see why that might be. Uh, it kind of complements what the informatic entropy reduction is uh, is doing. Uh, why is this chemical term reduced at exactly the same part of the system where the uh, phi dynamics is most irreversible? And that's because this is the only place where the chemical work can actually do anything. So chemistry is kind of churning away and it's pushing phi locally against the free energy of phi. That's why the, free, the system is out of equilibrium. So the, the place where the, the fluctuations in phi are visibly irreversible, namely close to the interface, is also the place where the locally there's least chemical work being wasted. So least local heat production, at least this is how I understand this at the moment. And there are similar results involving these non-trivial scalings for other models, including vectorial models that you can read about in that paper uh, if you want to know more. But what I'd like to do with uh, the rest of my time is a, is a little bit different. And that is to now think a little bit more carefully about what we mean by a backward path. <clears throat> so if I am close to equilibrium, uh, for instance, in the kind of system I just described, the heat flow is, is an objectively real thing. It's measurable in principle. I can somehow, at least in a thought experiment, cover my system with lots of calorimeters and I can see what the heat flow is. And that means there can't be two right answers for the heat flow. And so, however I've set up my system, there can only be one correct definition of the backward dynamics. Um, so I won't go into what that might be for different systems, but what I want to draw attention to the fact is that, 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 that I can't make that statement if I'm talking about the informatic entropy production where the connection between it and microscopic heat flow has been severed. So this is something I want to call the Toner 2 dilemma. So Toner and 2, as many of you will know, introduced one of the first continuum models for uh, flocking, and it could be of wildebeest or birds, but it could also be of fish as shown here. And uh, the way they set it up, there's a vector field, P of R and T, which they viewed as a current. So uh, if that's the case, then if I time reverse my dynamics, and this I shall call TR1, if that's a current, it must reverse on time reversal. So TR1 operating on P is minus P. But since then, a whole body of literature has grown up, made often, a lot of it describing subcellular systems, actually cytoskeletons and things like this, which are polar liquid crystal models, which P is a structural object. 
it refers to the orientation of some objects, such as these goldfish. So if that's structural, then on time reversal, okay, the goldfish have to swim backwards, but they're still pointing the same way. So if P is a structural vector, then time reversal operation number two on P is plus P. So P is even or odd, depending on whether it's current or structure. And of course, in the forward dynamics, it is both, because in the forward dynamics, fish swim in the forward direction. In the backward path, it can't possibly be both. We have to choose. We can choose TR1 or TR2. We, we can't uh, do both of those on P. But if we choose them, we get different answers. And the resulting informatic entropy reductions, I claim, are separately interesting. They reveal different facets of what, how irreversible the dynamics actually is. So uh, let's say a little bit more about that. So the equations in black at the top here are a diffusive flocking model that actually is in, includes Tona 2 as a special case. So I have a density, rho, its time derivative is the divergence of the current j. Uh, and there's also a, an orientational field p. So uh, over here we have, it says that the current is as self advecting along p with some uh, velocity omega. So the particles move along their orientations with uh, a w, I should call it. Uh, there can also be uh, uh, integrable terms from some kind of interactions or free energy or, uh, or other structure and noise. Uh, the p-dynamics has uh, a term lambda, which is quite unrelated to my previous lambda, uh, which is self-advection of p. And again, uh, as some response to a free energy structure with a non-conserved uh, relaxation rate gamma. These f's have to be the same if, to, if the uh, rest of this model is to be integral so that the advection terms are the only ones that are breaking time reversal, which is the easiest case to think about. And so there's some structure for f of p and rho. So for this class of models, uh, um, uh, both may calculated results for a number of phases. So the, the, the basic phase is the polar liquid, which is what these goldfish look like, a uniform system with a uniform in, in both uh, density and uh, in P, so orientation or swim direction. And in that case, it doesn't matter which of these uh, conventions I choose for reasons I'll explain on the next slide, that both of the informatic entropy reduction scale is d to the zero. So that's as they did for the interface in uh, active model B. And again, if I, that's the reason is basically if I have a uniform density, I look at the density fluctuations, uh, it's, I need fluctuations to see in the uniform phase to see any dynamics. However, I can also think of this polar liquid phase and put it in a field so that there's an orienting field on P. Let's call that orienting field H. And then H, again, there's two cases. One is where H is something like a fluid flow, which is reversed on time reversal. So the time reversal on H could be H goes to minus H. And in that case, depending on whether I also flip P, I either get D to the zero or D to the minus one. So I get a, a level at the a contribution at the level of the deterministic dynamics, uh, which is, is either present or not, depending on whether I flip P or not. And that's simply saying that P wants to be aligned with H. So if I flip H, I'd better flip P. Otherwise, the system looks very wrong. And if it looks very wrong, you'll get a very big entropy production because you're relying on the noise to make that system do something utterly different from what its thermodynamics is trying to tell it to do. If, on the other hand, I have, say, a food gradient, which clearly doesn't uh, change sign on time reversal, then I should choose the other choice of uh, backward path if I want to make the backward path look like a forward path. So um, this is beginning to point as, as, as to what these different entropy productions might be useful for. And I, I will elaborate that uh, on the slide after this one. Meanwhile, there's also other phases. So if I have a phase like this one, at the top right here. So in this movie, you're seeing a density pattern which is traveling uh, and it's got uh, a, a kind of obvious arrow to it. So this is a, a traveling cluster pattern uh, with an asymmetric waveform. And then uh, uh, both of these uh, entropy productions go uh, scale like noise to the minus one. So they both divert, they're both saying that there's deterministic steady entropy production not reliant on fluctuations. And that's because uh, I, I, to get this uh, traveling wave to look 
the same under time reversal, I have to reverse both the direction of the points here and the velocity. So I have to reverse P and V, and I can't do that uh, in either uh, TL1 or TL2. And similar things apply in the polar liquid phase, but apply to fluctuations. Okay, so I'm, uh, one more phase. Uh, there also, you can, in this generalized uh, flocking model, you can also get crystalline phases. So a static crystal in which uh, you have a density wave and a uh, uh, orientation of the particles, which for instance is pointing from high density to low, that's this picture bottom left here. And then uh, clearly if I uh, flip P on time reversal, I'll get a state which again looks extremely wrong because instead of pointing from high density to low, the P vector point points from low to high. So that will correspond to an enormously large entropy production. Whereas if I do flip, uh, do keep P the same, so that's TR2, then I get a, a, an entropy production that requires me to look at fluctuations before I see anything. So there's a kind of strategy emerging here, which is, is to, to, to make use of uh, the uh, informatic entropy production. What is it meant to be? Well, it's meant to be a tool for telling you how irreversible is the coarse grain dynamics of some arbitrary active system. Uh, that's uh, you know, why some of us have been studying it for quite some time. And so in deciding what you mean by irreversible, we have this choice. And the guideline is, if you have a choice here with P and the same would apply to other choices, choose it so as to make the informatic entropy production as small as you can and then see what remains. So let me explain with this diagram here, which comes from this recent review article that Etienne, Rob, Jack and I have written. Um, this is a, a school of fish. So the normal dynamics is the top left picture here. Uh, if I reverse the orientation, I get the top right picture there, which is obviously quite, and by the way, the little slopey lines here are like, they're meant to be like jet engines. It's telling you which way the fish are actually moving. So they're, the, the, they're telling you the back in terms of the motion. So the top right picture, well, I've only just done the orientational reversal and not reverse time. That's obviously a very unphysical looking situation. And so is the bottom left picture where the fish have not turned round, but the, uh, the velocity has. And this bottom left picture corresponds to a very big entropy production. Uh, in the bottom right picture, I have a much smaller entropy production. I've now reversed the orientation of the fish but there's still an entropy production. And that's because in the top left, this flock of fish, shoal of fish rather, has a blunt front and a tapered back. And in the bottom right, it has a blunt back and a tapered front. So I can still see that that shoal of fish uh, under, the, the, under uh, the, the second time reversal is not typical of the forward dynamic. So there will be in that case, if that's the kind of uh, system I have, there will still be an entropy reduction. So by essentially filtering out big and fairly obvious bits of entropy production by choosing uh, the right time reversal operation, I can expose what may be more interesting, in a sense, subdominant, but more physically uh, 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 intriguing aspects of the dynamics. So let me just conclude. Very briefly then. Um, so <clears throat> uh, in no particular order, if we take active matter that is properly microscopic, so it's close to equilibrium, it has a free energy, it has mobilities, it has a temperature, for instance, not all, but some subcellular environments, there's a, a, a heat production, which you can get directly from uh, the, the, the chem chemical reaction coordinate. And that equation is, as written there, is obvious. And it's true, but it's not the whole story because I can break that down into different interesting uh, spatial contributions, at least in systems with any kind of interfaces or phase separation. Uh, the informatic EPR, which comes from only looking at the dynamics of the coarse grain fields, such as phi, is a lower bound on the full heat production, but the different bits of this identify different aspects of local irreversibility. If I step back from that and I look at uh, uh, systems whose dynamics is so macroscopic that really to talk about heat production is not giving me any insight into the situation, uh, the informatic entropy production is still, however, useful because it is 
uh, tells us something about the character of the irreversibility in the system. And it's also calculable. I mean, that's important. I showed you examples for phi, but in, in, it, it's usually calculable as a power series in the noise and is in some cases calculable more precisely than that. Whereas in such a system, say, sheep, goat, phase separation, any attempt to calculate the full uh, entropy production is not only doomed, it's misguided because it doesn't tell me anything interesting about the behavior of sheep and goats at the scale of their phase separation. Uh, the time reversal operation in this case becomes user-defined and differently interesting outcomes uh, arise for each of the choices I might make. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, now we open the, the questions uh, round, so please raise your virtual hand. And okay, so I have uh, see a real hand raised. So please, Hans, uh, Herman, let me. You can unmute yourself and please talk. Yeah. Great, great talk, Michael. Thanks a lot. I have just a simple, simple question. You introduced this uh, term, the Zeta term, your B plus model. Yes. Do you think uh, this model, uh, this term has any physical relevance? And if yes, what would it be? I mean, what would the physical meaning of this term be? Um, okay, I, I won't go back to the slide. Uh, well, what uh, it, it is, well, it's relevant in the sense that generically it should be there and it has a good reason to vanish. That's the kind of usual kind of Landau-Ginsburg-like statement. There's no symmetry or other principle, which means that it has to not be there. Uh, in a more, a more um, appealing answer probably though, is uh, we, if you take interacting uh, active Brownian particles and you uh, coarse grain the particle dynamics to the level of hydrodynamic density, you get a, a field theory which looks like active model B, but it's not a nice five, four theories, a row log row, blah, 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 blah. But you can still uh, see what terms appear that are not of the free energy like structure. And uh, we did that early on and we found the lambda term. So we were very pleased and we stopped. It turns out that if, as uh, if, uh, so that we found in a system which has quorum sensing in the physicist sense of a system of self propelled particles whose, whose speed depends on the local density. Um, what we later found though is if, as well as that, you give them a direct force interaction. And then as if you have both of those things, you get both of those terms, or at least in their images in this row type theory rather than the phi four type theory. So uh, it may be that, they, that, that in, a, in a, a super minimal model, you won't get it, but I think generically uh, such a model will be structurally unstable in the sense that you will perturb it in some way and you'll find that term if you look for it. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We have uh, a couple more questions. Uh, uh, the first one by Alejandro Garcia. Uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, hello. Oh, uh, yeah. A very, very nice talk. And my question was, uh, when you wrote uh, y equals delta mu times g, uh, that seems contrary to the Curie uh, Perugian principle that in entropy production, you can't mix a scalar and a vector. So is the resolution that there's implicitly some, some surface? Uh, well, so look, uh, the, 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 I mean, I, I glossed this a little bit. The, the, uh, the, I've got a J, a current, and uh, a, uh, a, a, a rate of change of N. So um, I'm not, uh, yes. So right, we're right. used to we're used to saying that the, the active term in the current, say lambda grad phi, we, what, what we normally write was write down j with a uh, a gradient a grad a lambda grad grad phi squared, and we say well lambda is proportional to delta mu. That's the way the active matter modeling community would would speak about this, mm -hmm. and so that identifies uh, the grad grad phi squared piece as an off diagonal Onsago coupling. But J is a spacetime, uh, J of R and T is a spacetime current, and N is a spacetime, N of R and T is a spacetime uh, scalar. I don't think, I mean, well, I'm sure that such a coupling, coupling isn't forbidden completely. So I'm not quite sure what the restrictions are in terms of the uh, theorem you mentioned. 
Okay. Uh, I'd have to look at it more carefully, but thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We have one more question by Yuhai Tu. Actually, if I can just answer that, maybe I have a slightly better answer. If you look in the n dot equation here, uh, the thing which enters there is a g uh, times a vector. So, oh. that, so, so it, it, I think uh, you know I want a vector in the j equation, and that's mm -hmm. delta v times g, and then. I've got G coupled to a vector in the scalar equation. So I'm not quite sure uh, enough of the theorem you mentioned as to uh, know whether there is a problem there, but I'm pretty confident that this okay. is allowed. Okay. But it's uh, the, the Curie uh, Parisian principle is just that when you do entropy production, yes. uh, the, uh, a scalar and a vector can't couple like a, a flow and a difference of chemical potential in the, in the Onsager form, unless, there's like a surface, so you can say it's it's the flow dotted into the normal of the surface. Okay, and so, so, then, so, then the surface reaction can be coupled to that. Okay, well, thank you very much for that comment. I'd like to look into it and see uh, how how that gets resolved here. I'm a, I'm at the moment assuming that there is a resolution, but I can't um, identify. Okay, Thanks well, thank much. you. Thank you. So uh, please, you hi to uh, go ahead. Oh hi. Um, uh, thank you for a really nice talk. I really like the second part where you succeeded in computing the uh, entropy production in for the from the fear theory. I mean, we we have been recently trying to do that from a microscopic uh, flocking model where we do know how to compute that uh, dissipation or entropy production. Well, it'd rate. be interesting to compare them. Yeah, and and we've had similar discussions in the particle-based models for a scalar active matter, so-called, are just self-propelled particles with no yeah. orientation field. And uh, of course, when you do it on the particle models, you get a lot more entropy production uh, because you're doing something more microscopic. And there, are, there, yeah. there that, that, then one gets a, a sort of, uh, yeah, so there's, I think there's plenty of work to be done to try and join up these scales and see to what extent the information at one level is still there at another, or whether it, it, each time you move down in detail, you just swamp what you have. Yeah, let me just tell you that, that sort of this is something just sort of a, a poor man's way to do it because I started thinking about this problem at the continuum, of course, from the equation that we, uh, you know, we had. Yes, yes. But we, we uh, I, I, at least I didn't know how to do it. But at the same time, we were doing a lot of work in, uh, in a biochemical system where we do know how to do these things. That's a sort of microscopic active matter, if you wish. Mm -hmm. So that's the, we end up doing that. So, so going back to the one thing that I would get stuck in look, looking at the field theory approach to computing the dissipation was the fact that, I don't know, just given the long drawing equation, uh, I don't know how to separate this F versus Y, right, in your language, that the sort of external forcing versus sort of a free yes. energy. I mean, that's sort of- Well, there's certainly, there's certainly ambiguity because if I have, um, a uh, if my definition of y is something which doesn't isn't a, isn't a functional derivative, say, then obviously I can add something that is. Right. And, yeah. That's and the, and the answer still isn't. So the, the, in, it, all we can say is that uh, the f part is very restricted in form, and uh, it, it, it it you can if you had if you had some part of y that was also a, a derivative, I mean the, the equations would all still be true it just wouldn't give you anything in steady state. So you'd find out about the time you get to integral of j dot y, that this was some kind of exact derivative. And so wouldn't actually have a value, uh, you know, wouldn't contribute to the steady state. So uh, if I call, if I um, take y of the same, same time, I just, I, I just split into an F1 and F2, then the steady state entropy production is still, it's delta, it's delta F1 over infinity. And then I look at the second term and that's gonna be delta F2 over infinity, or, you know, over the time interval, if you see what I mean. So the, by the time you get to the answer, it doesn't actually matter if you've slipped some integrable stuff into Y because it won't contribute. But it, what it will do is it will confuse your thinking about- Yeah, that's exactly what happened. And then yeah. plus the sort of, uh, <laughs> Practical difficulty of doing pass integral and 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 then integrating over different yes. passes. That that's becoming yes. a, a so so one one advantage of the, of, the, of the scalar models is that for something like lambda grad grad phi squared, uh, it's very it's very uh, clear that this isn't a functional derivative. Now I can I can uh, 
uh, cook up a square gradient term which produces a piece like that. And but you know, but 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 the the model is simple enough that you can be pretty confident about the separations of these two bits. But in general, it's ambiguous. So I did have one thought that I, I thought about it a little bit, but not didn't pursue very far. Maybe you have some uh, opinion and, or, or insight about that. I always thought that if I think about the two processes, one due to F, one due to Y as two operator, and, uh, and, and the reason they don't, uh, you know, they are incompatible in some sense, because either, either one of them can be gradient, but the, the, some, in some space, but somehow it, it, it incompatibility was uh, somehow it related to the fact that they, the operator, if you think about them as operator, doesn't commute. They don't commute. So they can't share a Boltzmann distribution, basically. Right. I think that's that a slightly is... different channel, actually. We're quite, I'm sort of straying off the topic a little bit. But something we separately studied is a scalar uh, field theory like, like a model A slash B. In fact, we call it model AB, uh, where you have one scalar field, it has a conservative dynamics and it has a non conservative dynamics, and these are governed by different free energies. And that seems to me much more like the case you just described. Mm -hmm. So then I've got two channels in the dynamics, and they have an, a, an incompatibility at the level of the free energies, even though if I switch either of those channels off, I have detailed balance for the other one. So it, it, it maybe there's a connection there. Okay. All right. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, let me thank uh, Professor Michael Cates for a wonderful talk and our uh, three speakers of this afternoon for a very interesting session. Um, just a very short reminder. Uh, recall that uh, tomorrow we start at 3 p.m. Spanish time. Uh, because of time difference. Uh, uh, so, so please just bear that in mind for tomorrow. So I think that's all. Thank you, uh, everybody, for being here. And see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.